Chapter 4 Emptiness The Reality Beyond Reality Emptiness is described as the basis that makes everything possible. The Twelve Thai Situpa Rinpoche Awakening the Sleeping Buddha the sense of openness people experience when they simply rest their mind is known in Buddhist terms as emptiness, which is probably one of the most misunderstood words in Buddhist philosophy. It is hard enough for Buddhists to understand the term, but Western readers have an even more difficult time because many of the early translators of Sanskrit and Tibetan Buddhist texts interpreted emptiness as the void or nothingness, mistakenly equating emptiness with the idea that nothing at all exists. N nothing could be further from the truth the Buddha sought to describe. While the Buddha did teach that the nature of the mind, in fact the nature of all phenomena, is emptiness, he didn't mean that their nature was truly empty like a vacuum. He said it was emptiness, which in the Tibetan language is made up of two words, tongpa ni. The word tongpa means empty, but only in the sense of something beyond our ability to perceive with our senses and our capacity to conceptualize. Maybe a better translation would be inconceivable or unnameable. The word ny, meanwhile, doesn't have any particular meaning in everyday Tibetan conversations. But when added to another word, it conveys a sense of possibility, a sense that anything can arise, anything can happen. So when Buddhists talk about emptiness, we don't mean nothingness rather an unlimited potential for anything that anything to appear change or disappear perhaps we can use an analogy here to what contemporary physicists have learned about this strange and wonderful phenomena they see when they examine the inner workings of an atom according to the physicists with whom i have spoken the basis from which all subatomic phenomena arise is often referred to as the vacuum state. The state of lowest energy in the subatomic universe. In the vacuum state, particles continually appear and disappear. So although seemingly empty, this state is actually very active, full of the pot potential to produce anything whatsoever. In this sense, the vacuum shares certain qualities with the empty quality of the mind, just as the vacuum is considered empty, yet is the source from which all manner of particles appear. The mind is essentially empty in that it defies absolute descriptions, yet out of this Indef indefinable and incompletely knowledgeable basis, all thoughts, emotions, and sensations perpetually arise. Because the nature of your mind is emptiness, you possess the capacity to experience a potentially unlimited variety of thoughts, emotions, and sensations. Even misunderstandings of emptiness are simply phenomena arising out of emptiness. A simple example may help you gain some understanding of emptiness on an experiential level. A few years ago, a student came to me asking for a teaching on emptiness. I gave him the basic explanation and he appeared to be quite happy, thrilled, in fact. That's so cool, he replied at the end of our conversation. My own experience had taught me that emptiness isn't so easy to understand after one lesson. So I instructed him to spend the next several days meditating on what he had learned. 
A few days later, the student suddenly arrived outside my room with an expression of terror in, on his face, pale, hunched, and shaking. He stepped carefully across the room, like someone testing the ground in front of him for quicksand. When he finally stepped in front of where I was sitting, he said, Rinpoche, you told me to meditate on emptiness, but last night it occurred to me that if everything is emptiness, then this whole building is emptiness. The floors are emptiness, and the ground underneath is emptiness. If that's the case, why shouldn't we all fall through the floor and down through the ground? I waited until he finished speaking. Then I asked, who would fall? He thought about the question for a moment and then his expression changed completely. Oh, he exclaimed, I get it. If the building is emptiness and people are emptiness, there is no one to fall and nothing to fall through. He gave a long sigh, his body relaxed and the color returned to his face. So I asked him again to meditate on emptiness with this new understanding. Two or three days later, he again arrived at my room unexpectedly. Pale and shaking again, he entered the room and seemed quite clear he was trying as best he could do. He could too hold his breath, terrified of exhaling. Sitting down in front of me, he said, Rinpoche, I meditated on emptiness as you, as you instructed. And I understood that just like this building and the ground below are emptiness, I am also emptiness. But as I kept pursuing this meditation, I kept going deeper and deeper until I stopped being able to see or feel anything. I'm so afraid that if I'm nothing more than emptiness, I'm just going to die. That's why I ran to see you this morning. If I'm just emptiness, then I'm basically nothing, and there is nothing to keep me from just dissolving away into nothingness. When I was sure he was finished, I asked, Who is, who is it that would dissolve? I waited a few moments for him to observe this question, then pressed on. You have mistaken emptiness for nothingness. Almost everybody makes the same mistake in the beginning, trying to understand emptiness as an idea or a concept. I made the same mistake myself. But there is really no way to understand emptiness conceptually. You can only really recognize it through direct experience. I'm not asking you to believe me. All I'm saying is that the next few times you sit down to meditate, ask yourself, if the nature of everything is emptiness, who or what can dissolve? Who or what is born and who or what can die? Try that. And the answer you get may surprise you. After a sigh, he agreed to try again. Several days later, he returned to my room, smiling peacefully as he announced, I think I'm starting to uh, I understand emptiness. I asked him to explain. I followed your instructions, and after meditating on the subject for a long time, I realized that emptiness is in nothingness, because there must be something before there can be nothing. Emptiness is everything, all possibilities of existence and non-existence imaginable occurring simultaneously. So if our true nature is emptiness, then nobody can be said to truly die or no one can be said to be truly born, because the possibility of being in a certain way and not being in a certain way is present within us at every moment. Very good, I told him. Now forget everything you just said, because if you try to remember it exactly, you will turn everything you learn 
into a concept and you will have to start all over again. Two realities, absolute and relative. Ultimate truth cannot be taught without basis on relative truth. Nagarjuna, my Demakarika, translated by Maria Montenegro. Most of us require time to contemplate and meditate in order to comprehend emptiness. When I teach on this subject, one of the first questions I'm usually asked is, well, if the basis of reality is emptiness, where does everything come from? It is a good question, in fact, a very profound one. But the relationship between emptiness and experience isn't so simple, or rather, it is so simple that it's easy to miss. It is actually out of the unlimited potentials of emptiness that phenomena, a catch-all term that includes thoughts, emotions, sensations, and even material objects can appear, move, change, and ultimately vanish. Instead of going into a discussions of quantum mechanics, the contemporary branch of physics that examines matters on atomic and subatomic levels, which I admit is not my area of expertise. I have found that the best way to describe this aspect of emptiness is by going back to the analogy of space as understood in the Buddha's time, a vast openness that is not a thing in itself, but rather an infinite, uncharacterized background against and through which galaxies, stars, planets, animals, human beings, rivers, trees, and so forth appear and move. In the absence of space, none of these things could appear distinct or individual. There would be no room for them, no background against which they could be seen. Stars and planets can only come into being, move about, and dissolve against the background of space. We, ourselves, are able to stand, sit, and walk in out of a room only because of the space that surrounds us. Our own bodies are filled with space. The external openings that allow us to breathe swallow, speak, and so on, as well as the space within our internal organs, such as the lungs that open and close as we inhale and exhale. A similar relationship exists between emptiness and phenomena. Without emptiness, nothing could appear. In the absence of phenomena, we, should, we wouldn't be able to experience the background of emptiness out of which everything appears. So, in a sense, you'd have to say that there is a friend relationship between emptiness and phenomena. But there is also an important distinction. Emptiness or infinite possibility is the absolute nature of reality. Everything that appears out of emptiness, stars, galaxies, people, tables, lamps, clocks, and even our perceptions of time and space is a relative expression of infinite possibility, a momentary appearance in the context of infinite time and space. I would like to take this moment to point out another extremely important distinction between absolute and relative reality. According to Buddhist understanding, and also apparently to some modern Western schools of scientific thought. Only something that doesn't change, that, that can't be affected by time and circumstance, or broken down into smaller, connected parts, can be said to be absolute real. Using this definition as a basis, I was taught that emptiness, the immeasurable, indefinable potential that is the background of all phenomena, uncreated and unaffected by changes in causes or conditions is absolute reality. And since natural mind is emptiness, completely open and unlimited by any sort of un any sort of nameable or definable characteristics, 
nothing anyone thinks or says about phenomena and nothing I think or say about phenomena can truly be said to define its true nature. In other words, absolute reality cannot be expressed in words, images, or even symbolism of mathematical formulas. I have heard that a number of religions also understand that the nature of the absolute cannot be expressed in these ways and refuse to describe the absolute in names or images. On this point, at least Buddhism agrees. The absolute can only be comprehended through experience. At the same time, it would be absurd to deny that we live in a world where things appear, change, and disappear in space and time. People come and go, tables break and chip, someone drink a glass of water and the water is gone. In Buddhist terms, this level of endlessly changing experience is known as relative reality. Relative that is, compared with the unchanging and indefinable conditions of absolute reality. So while it would be foolish to pretend that we don't experience things like tables, water, thoughts, and planets, at the same time we can't say that any of these things inherently exist in a complete, self-sufficient, independent way. By definition, anything that inherently exist must be permanent and unchanging. It can be broken down into smaller parts or affected by shifts in causes or in causes and conditions. That's nice. Intellectual description of the relationship between absolute and relative reality. But it doesn't really provide the intuitive or as we would say today gut level understanding needed to really grasp that relationship. When pressed by his student to explain the relationship between absolute and relative reality, the Buddha often resorted to the example of dreams, pointing out that our experiences in waking life are similar to the experiences we have in dreams. The dream examples he used naturally involved things that were relevant to the students of his day. Cows, grain, thatch roofs, and mud wall. I'm not sure those examples would have the same impact on people living in the 21st century. So, when I teach, I tend to use examples relevant to the people I'm talking to. For example, Suppose you are the type of person who really loves cars. You'd probably feel thrilled to dream that someone has given you a brand new car without you having to spend a penny to get it. The dream you would be happy to receive the dream car, happy to drive it, and happy to show it off to everyone that you know. But suppose in the dream you are driving along when suddenly another car smashes into you. The front of your car is completely ruined and you have broken one of your legs. In the dream your mood would probably shift immediately from happiness to despair. Your car's been ruined. You don't have any dream insurance and your broken leg is causing tremendous pain. You might even begin to cry in the dream. And when you wake up, your pillow might be wet with tears. Now I'm going to ask a question, but, but not a difficult one. Is the car in the dream real or not? The answer, of course, is that it is not. No engineers designed the car and no factory built it. It isn't made of various parts that constitute an actual car or of the molecules and atoms that make up each of the different parts of a car. Yet, while dreaming you experience the car as something quite real. In fact, you relate to everything in your dreams as real. You respond to experience you respond to exp your experiences with very real thoughts and emotions. 
But no matter how real your dream experiences may seem, they can be said to exist inherently, can they? When you wake up, the dream ceases and everything you re perceive in the dream dissolves into emptiness. The, in the infinite possibility for everything, for anything to occur. The Buddha taught that in the same way, Every form of experience is an appearance arising from the infinite possibility of emptiness. As stated in the Heart Sutra, one of the most famous of the Buddha's teachings, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Emptiness is nothing other than form. Form is nothing other than emptiness. In modern terms, you might say, a dream car is not inherently real car. A not inherently real car is a dream car. A dream car is nothing other than a not inherently real car. A not inherently real car is nothing other than a dream car. Of course, it may be argued that things you experience in the waking life and the events you experience in a dream can't logically be compared. After all, when you wake from a dream, you don't really have a broken leg or a wrecked car in the driveway. If you got into, a, into an accident in waking life, though you might find yourself in the hospital and facing thousands of dollars worth of damage to your car. Nevertheless, the basis of your experience is the same in dreams and in waking life. Thoughts, feelings, and sensations that vary according to changing conditions. If you bear this comparison in mind, whatever you experience in the waking life begins to lose its power to affect you. Thoughts are just thoughts, feelings are just feelings, sensations are just sensations. They come and go in the waking life as quickly and easily as they do in dreams. Everything you experience is subject to change. According to changing conditions, if even a single condition is changed, the form of your experience will change. Without a dreamer, there would be no dream. Without the mind of the dreamer, there would be no dream. If the dreamer were not sleeping, there would be no dream. All these circumstances have to come together in order, to, in order for a dream to occur. An exercise in emptiness. The mind is empty in essence. Although empty, everything constantly arises in it. The third Gwalwang Karmapa. Song of Karmapa, the aspirations of the Mahamudra of true meaning. Translated by Eric Pema Kunsang. Intellectual understanding of emptiness is one thing. Direct experience is another. So let's try another exercise a little different from the ones described in previous chapters. This time, you will look at your thoughts, emotions, and sensations very closely. As they ar arise out of emptiness, momentarily appear as emptiness, and dissolve back into emptiness. If no thoughts, feelings, or sensations come up for you, just make them up, as many as you can, very quickly one after another. The main point of the exercise is to observe as many forms of experience as you can. If you don't observe them, they will just slip away unnoticed. Don't lose any of the thoughts, feelings, or sensations without having observed them. Begin by sitting up straight in a relaxed position and breathing normally. Once you are settled, start to observe your thoughts, emotions, and sensations very clearly. Remember, if nothing comes up for you, just start gibbering away in your mind. Whatever you perceive, pain, pressure, pain, pressure, sounds, and so on, observe it very clearly. Even ideas like, this is a good thought. This is a bad thought. I like this exercise or I hate this exercise. Are thoughts you can observe. 
You can even observe something as simple as an itch. To get the full effect, you will want to continue this process for at least a minute. Are you ready? Okay, then go. Watch the movements of your mind. Watch the movement of your mind. Watch the movement of your mind. Now, stop. The point of the exercise is simply to watch everything that passes through your awareness as it arises out of emptiness, momentarily appears, and dissolves back into emptiness again. A movement like the rising and falling of a wave in a giant ocean. You don't want to block your thoughts, emotions, and so on, nor do you want to chase after them. If you chase after them, you let them lead you, they begin to define you, and you lose your ability to respond openly and spontaneously in the present moment. On the other hand, if you attempt to block your thoughts, your mind can become quite tight and small. This is an important point because many people mistakenly believe meditation involves deliberately stopping the natural movement of thought and emotions. It is possible to block this movement for a little while and even achieve a fleeting sense of peace. But it is the, the peace of a zombie, a completely thoughtless, emotionless state, is a state dev devoid of discernment or clarity. If you practice allowing your mind just to be as it is, however, your mind will eventually settle down on its own. You will develop a sense of spaciousness while your ability to experience things clearly without bias will gradually increase. Once you begin to watch these thoughts, emotions, and so on come and go with awareness, you will start to recognize that they are all relative phenomena. They can only be defined by their relation to other experiences. A happy thought is distinguished by its difference from an unhappy, from an unhappy thought. Just as a tall person may be distinguished as tall only in relation to someone who is shorter. But himself, that person is neither tall nor shorter. Similarly, a thought or a feeling can't in itself be described as positive or negative except through comparisons with other thoughts. Without this kind of comparison, a thought, a feeling, or a perception is just what it is. It has no inherent qualities or characteristics and can be defined in itself except through comparison. The Physics of Experience Physical objects do not exist in space, but are especially extended. In this way, the concept of empty space loses its meaning. Albert Einstein, Relativity, 15th edition. In my conversations with modern scientists, I have been struck by a number of similarities between the principles of quantum mechanics and the Buddhist understanding of the relationship between emptiness and appearance. Because the words we used were different, it took me quite a, a while to recognize that we were talking about the same thing, phenomena unfolding moment by moment caused and conditioned by an almost infinite number and variety of events. In order to appreciate these similarities, I found it important to understand something about the principles of classical physics, the foundation on which quantum mechanics is built. Classical physics is a general term that describes a set of theories about the workings of the natural world based on the insights of the 17th century genius Sir Isaac Newton, and a scientist who contributed to his understanding and followed in his footsteps. In, term of classic, in terms of classical physics, the universe was understood as a giant, orderly machine. 
according to this machine model, if one knew that location and velocity, that is, the speed and direction of its movement of every particle in the universe and the forces between them at a particle in instant of time, then, then it would be possible to predict the position and velocity of every particle in the universe at any future time. Similarly, one could figure out the complete past history of the universe from a complete description of its present state. The history of the universe could be understood as a giant web of histories of individual particles connected by absolute not knowable laws of cause and effect. The laws and theories of classical physics, however, were based in large part on observations of large-scale phenomena, such as the movements of stars and planets and interactions among material objects on Earth. But technological advances in the 19th, in the 19th and 20th centuries enabled scientists to study the behavior of phenomena on smaller and smaller scales, and their experiments which form the basis of quantum mechanics. The fundamental, the fundamental framework of modern physics began to show that at extremely small scales, material phenomena didn't behave in the nice, orderly, predictable fashion described by classical physics. One of the most perplexing aspects of these experiments involved the revolution revel, re, Revelation, to, uh, revelation that what we ordinarily consider matter may not be as solid and definable as once was believed. When observed on a subatomic level, matter behaves rather strangely, sometimes exhibiting properties commonly associated with material particles and sometimes appearing as non-material waves of energy. As I understand it, these particle waves can be defined simultaneously in terms of location and velocity. So the classical notions of describing the state of the universe in terms of the location and velocities of particles falls apart. Just as quantum mechanics develop over time from the laws of classical physics, in a similar sort of way, the Buddha's description of the nature of the experience evolved gradually with each insight building upon the previous one according to the level of understanding of those who heard them. These teachings are historically divided into three sets, referred to as the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma. The Sanskrit word Dharma in this sense means the truth and more simply, the, thing, the way things are. The Buddha gave his first set of teachings in an open space known as the Deer Park near Varanasi, a district in India now known as Benares. This first set of teachings described the relative nature of reality based on observable physical experience. The teachings of the first turnings are often, sum, uh, are often summed up in a series of statements commonly known as the Four Noble Truths, but which may be more accurately described as four pure insights into the way things are. These four insights may be summarized as follows. 1. Ordinary life is conditioned by suffering. 2. Suffering results from causes. 3. The causes of suffering can be extinguished. 4. There is a simple path through which the causes of suffering can be extinguished. In the second and third turnings, the Buddha began to describe the, the characteristic of absolute reality. The second turning, which was given on Vulture's Peak, a mountain located in the northeastern Indian state of Bihar focused on the nature of emptiness, loving-kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is a Sanskrit word that is often translated as the mind or heart of 
awakening. The third turning of the wheel, in which the Buddha described the fundamental characteristic of the Buddha, of Buddha nature, was given in various places around India. On their own, the three turnings of the wheel are fascinating in terms of what they tell us about the nature of the mind, the universe, and the ways in which the mind perceives experience. But they also serve to clarify ideas that arose from among the Buddha's earliest followers. After the Buddha passed away, his followers didn't always agree on the exact interpretations of what he had said. Some of them may not have heard all three turnings of the wheel. The disagreements between them were only natural, since as the Buddha repeatedly stressed, the essence of what he thought couldn't be grasped by intellectual understanding alone, but could only be realized through direct experience. Those who had learned only the teachings of the first turning of the wheel developed two schools of thought, the Vaibhashika and the Sautantrika views, according to which infinite, according to which Infinitesimally small particles, known in Tibetan as Dultren or Dultren Chamai, which may be roughly translated respectively as smallest particles and indivisible particles, were understood to be absolutely real, in the sense that they were complete in themselves unable to be broken down into smaller parts. These fundamental particles were considered the essential building blocks of, the all, of all phenomena. They could never be dissolved or lost, only converted to different forms. For example, the dull turn chamai of wood wasn't lost when a log was set on fire, but was merely converted into smoke or flame, a point of view not unlike the law of conservation of energy, a basic principle of physics that holds that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but only converted into other forms. For example, the chemical energy in gasoline can be converted into the mechanical energy that moves the car. At this point, you may be wondering what the development of modern physics has to do with attaining personal happiness. But if you will bear with me for a while, the relationship will become clear. The Buddha's later teachings demonstrated that the simple fact that infinitesimally small particles could be converted, as Albert Einstein would prove centuries later through his famous equations E, equal mc2 which in very basic terms describe particles as little packets of energy indicated that adulterant or adulterant adulterant chamai was in fact a transitory phenomenon and consequently could not be considered fundamentally or absolutely real to use an everyday example, think of water. Under very cold conditions, water turns to ice. At room temperature, water is liquid. When heated, it becomes steam. In laboratory experiments, the molecules of water can be separated into hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And when these atoms are examined more closely, they consist of smaller and smaller subatomic particles. There is an interesting parallel between the Vaibhashika and the Sautantrika views and the classical schools of physics. According to classical physics, and I am probably oversimplifying the case in order to make the ideas easier to grasp, the basic elements of matter, as well as large entities like stars, planets, and human bodies, can be described in terms of precisely measurable properties such as location and velocity. 
and move in nicely predictable ways through space and time in perfect coordination with certain forces such as gravity and electricity. The classical interpretation still worked very well in terms of predicting the behavior of large-scale phenomena, like the movements of planets. As explained to me, however, advances in technology in the 19th century began to provide physicists with the means to observe material phenomena in microscope detail. In the early 20th century, the British physicist J. J. Thompson, uh, Thompson pursued a set of experiments that led him to discover that the atom was not a solid entity, but was instead composed of smaller particles, most notably electronically charged particles called electrons. Building on Thomson's experiments, the physicist Edward Rutherford devised a model of the atom, familiar to most Westerners who have taken a high school chemistry or physics class, as a kind of miniature solar system composed of electrons that revolved around a central core of the atom called the nucleus. The problem with the Rutherford's solar system model of the atom was that it didn't account for the observed fact that atoms always radiate light of certain characteristic energies when heated up. The set of energy levels, which is different for each type of atom, is commonly referred to as the atom's spectrum. In 1914, Niels Bohr realized that if the electrons inside an atom were treated as waves, the atom's energy spectrum could be precisely explained. This was one of the great early successes of quantum mechanics and forced the scientific world to begin taking this strange new theory seriously. At about the same time, however, Albert Einstein demonstrated that it was possible to describe light not as waves but as particles, which he called photons. When photons were directed at a metal plate, they accelerated the activity of electrons, producing electricity. Following up on Einstein's discovery, a number of physicists began experiments that showed that all form of energy might conceivably be described in terms of particles, a perspective very similar to the Vibosic point of view. As modern physicists, as modern physicists continue to study the world of subatomic phenomena, they are still confronted by the problem that subatomic phenomena, what we might call the building block of reality or experience, sometimes behave like particles and sometimes like waves. Thus, they can only determine the prob probability that a subatomic entity will exhibit certain properties or behave in a certain way. While there appears to be no doubt that quantum theory is accurate in terms of practical applications, as demonstrated in the development of lasers, transistors, supermarket scanners, and computer chips. The quantum explanation of the universe remains a rather abstract mathematical description of phenomena. But it's important to remember that ma ma mathematics is a symbolic language, a type of poetry that uses numbers and symbols instead of words to convey a sense of reality underlying our conventional experiences experience the freedom of probability fresh awareness of whatever arises is sufficient the ninth gualwang karmapa mahamudra the oceans of definitive meaning translated by elizabeth m Callahan. in his early teachings the buddha addressed the problem of suffering in terms of fixations on an inherently existing or what's absolutely real level of experience, 
including a belief in an inherently real self and inherently real existence of material phenomena. Later, as his audience became more sophisticated, he began to address emptiness and Buddha nature more directly. Similarly, the ideas of classical physicists regarding the nature and behavior of material objects were gradually redefined and updated by the effort of scientists of the late 19th century. As mentioned earlier, modern scientists' observations of matter on the subatomic level led them to recognize that elements of the subatomic world sometimes behaved very nicely as think-like particles when observed under certain experimental conditions. But when observed under other conditions, they behave more like waves. These observations of wave-particle duality marked in many ways the birth of the new physics of quantum mechanics. I imagine that this peculiar behavior was probably not altogether comfortable to the scientists who first observed it. To use a somewhat simple analogy, imagine someone you thought you knew very well treated you like a best friend one moment, and half an hour later look at you as though he and or she had never seen you before. You might call this kind of behavior two-faced. On the other hand, it must have been very exciting, since direct observations of the behavior of, a ma of matter open up a whole new world of investigation, quite similar to the world that opens up to us when we begin to actively engage in observing the activity of our own minds. There is so much to see and so much to, to learn. With their customary diligence, physicists of the early 20th century went back to the drawing board in order to explain the behavior of the wave-like nature of particles. Building on Niels Bohr's picture of the wave-like nature of electrons inside atoms, they eventually arrive at a new description of subatomic world, which in very detailed mathematical terms describes how every particle in the known universe can be understood as a wave. And every wave as a particle. In the other worlds, in other words, the particles that make up the largest material universe can be seen from one perspective as things and from another as occurrences extending through time and space. So what does physics have to do with being happy? We like to think of ourselves as solid, distinct individuals with well-defined goals and personalities. But if we look honestly at the discoveries of modern science, we have to admit that this view of ourselves is at best incomplete. The teachings of the Buddha are often grouped into two categories, the teachings on wisdom or theory and the teaching on method or practice. The Buddha himself, often compare these categories to the wings of a bird. In order to fly, a bird needs two wings. The, two, the wing of wisdom is necessary because without at least some idea of what you are aiming for, the wing of practice flaps pretty much uselessly. People who go to the gym, for example, have at least a rough idea of what they want to gain by sweating on the treadmill or lifting weights. The same principle applies to the effort to directly recognize our inborn capacity for happiness. We need to know where we are going in order to get there. Modern science, specifically quantum physics and neuroscience, 
offers an approach to wisdom in terms that are at once more acceptable and more specifically demonstrable to people living in the 21st century than are the Buddhist insights into the nature of reality gained through a subjective analysis. It not only helps to explain why the Buddhist practices work in terms of hard scientific analysis, but also provides fascinating insights into the Buddhist understanding of Daldrin Chamai, the momentary phenomena that appear and disappear in, a, in an instant according to changes in causes and conditions. But we have to look deeper into the realm of science to discover some of these parallels.